Um, right. Loaves and fishes in St. Andrews. We've got a bit of evidence for both. We also have quite a lot of water, a certain amount of poo and a dead dog, but they didn't work quite so well in the title and certainly wouldn't have looked quite so good on the title slide. Um, so, Headland site at 100 North Street, St. Andrews, the old police station site, has now been knocked down and there's a mildly unpleasant block of flats there. Um, uh, we did the excavation in between and as Rachel said, Steve Cox was here a couple of years ago to tell you about it when we were relatively freshly off site. Um, since then we've had a bit more time to have a closer look, more interpretation, and we've managed to tease some more information out of it. So here's where the site is. You guys know where St. Andrews is. Um, here it is a bit more specifically on the south side of North Street. Um, and here it is on Geddes town plan of about 1580. This is the, there it is there, um, the earliest detailed plan of St. Andrews. Um, we, we don't know exactly where it is because the closers on Getty don't quite play ball with reality, but um, it's approximately there. Um, so that is about 100 meters northwest of the market cross. Can you see the point of that? Right, so the market cross is there. And, um, and there's the friary down to the south west of the site. And the castle and cathedral are away there over on the east side. Um, it's generally supposed that, that this part of St. Andrews, where the site was, was um, that settlement began there in around the 13th century, and that is broadly what we found. And just while we're on this slide, can I just point out this east-west ditch, or east-west boundary, I should say, along here. So that's between the south end of the plots off the south side of North Street and the north side of the plots off the north side of Market Street. Um, dividing the, the space in two. Just remember that. Um, I've got something to show you relating to it later. Um, so here's a site under excavation. Um, there was no archaeology survived underneath the demolished police station. We knew that from the, where, where the street frontage is. We knew that from the evaluation. So the excavation area stretched the, the length of the backlands behind it. And here's what we found, pits and ditches, it's always pits and ditches, isn't it? Um, the earliest features are the ones in this fetching shade of pale blue. Um, and they included this ditch here, um, which, remember that boundary I showed you on Getty, that's what we think this is. It's in about the right sort of place, runs east-west across the entire um, width of the site, so we think that is the southern plot boundary. Um, it is one of the earliest features on site, so that fits with it being related to the laying out of the Burgage plots. And we also found, slightly more enigmatically, this ditch here, which is um, running eccentrically to the road, so potentially that is pre-Burgle, although we had no good dating evidence for it. Um, and it's a little ambiguous. In terms of um, pre-Burgle activity, we did have one distinctly pre-Burgle um, radiocarbon date. This one up here, which is 1030 to 1160. Um, so not this, this dotted line here, that is the foundation of the borough in the 1140s. So, as you can see, it's not definitely pre-Burgle, but odds are it's, um, it is. But it was from a piece of heather charcoal, which seems to be residual in the phase two pit because it was associated with a bunch of pottery. Um, we know there was pre-Burgle activity in the vicinity because there was a boat-shaped house predating the Burgage plots was found at the site immediately to the west at 106 North Street. Um, unfortunately, not fully published, but it's possible that this bit of charcoal 
relates to activity there. So this site, we couldn't really add anything conclusive to the whole um, pre-Burgle settlement debate. Um, what we did find is a nice little fragment of um, uh, borough backland activity. So um, phase two, which you can see in this pale orange, um, it includes these east-west ditches running across the top, which we, which seem to be um, dividing the plot off, so possibly fencing off the backland area from the, the frontage area, so possibly for livestock control to keep the animals out of the kitchen garden kind of thing, or to subdivide the land between different subtenants. Um, we also have at least two features that seem to relate to water management. Uh, this one up here first. This is, um, uh, is a series of three intercutting pits with a complex sequence of fills and recuts. And it might originally have been cut as an extraction pit for sand, but then it has this channel leading into it, um, which seems to have been eroded through frequent access. So it's possible it was frequented to access the water that collected within it. Um, the land, by the way, slopes gently down to the north, so water would have flowed northwards um, on the site. Um, and then there's this one down here, which is a bit more defined and seems to have had a bit more work spent on it. Uh, here is the close-up of it. Um, it's, it has this pit here, and here, um, and then there was a narrow channel here, which drained into it, and there were these capstones here that were put over the top of the channel, and they stepped down into it. Here you can just see a couple of upright stones at the side. There were further stones that laid across the top of those, so it was a, a stone path that stepped down towards the pit. So um, obviously they've gone to some effort to make access to this pit um, easy, but it's not clear whether the pit was to extract water that collected within it, to extract water out of it, or whether it was to deposit deposits in it. So in other words, was it a well, was it a cesspit? Um, there is this ring of post holes around the pit, here, 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 here. Um, so the post might have supported a windlass structure to help extract water, or it might have supported a small enclosure fence to provide some privacy while doing the necessary into it. There's, um, there's no evidence of cess in the deposits within it, but I asked our enviro people if you would necessarily expect them to survive, and the answer was no, given that it's aerobic free-draining conditions, um, it could any cess deposits could completely rot away and wash away to nothing. So it's entirely possible this was used as a privy. Uh, so um, back to the next phase in this purple. The most interesting things we have in this were, actually don't look that impressive on this plan. There's this pit here, which is almost entirely invisible. It was under um, some modern services, and this little blobby thing up here at the north end. So we'll start with the blobby thing. Here's what it looked like on the ground. Remains of a burnt clay floor with a flue to the south, this way, um, but no remains of superstructure and not many deposits that could be linked to its use. Just a few fragments of charcoal and oak grains. Now, could have had a lot of functions, um, metal working furnace, for example, but there was no associated iron slag, no iron slag from anywhere on the site, in fact. Um, it could have been a corn drain kiln, although no great deposits of grain. But given the location, I think it is most likely one of these, a medieval bread oven. Um, it's exactly where you'd expect a bread oven to be, that is relatively close to the street fronted structures, but set apart from them due to the fire risk. Um, 
and you wouldn't expect to find great piles of waste materials associated with baking bread, um, just a bit of charcoal and burnt clay, which is what we got. Um, and then the pit, the little pit under the modern services, you can see the modern services here, made it very difficult to excavate. Poor Tony here was, um, did a great job with it. Um, the most notable thing about this little pit was the jug that was in it. You can just see it starting to poke out here. Complete jug. Here's what it looked like when it came out. Um, completely intact. There was a hairline crack that ran around the, the base and it, when we cleaned it up it fell apart at the base but that just made it easier to extract the contents out from inside it and it was and it, it fitted, it fitted back together again, no problem at all. Um, there was nothing of note inside it at all, just more of the same kind of fill as was in the pit. Um, but the question really was, what was it doing there? Here's um, how it was sitting within the pit. Um, it's not obviously refuse disposal because it was still completely intact and usable, and it doesn't appear to have been deliberately set into the pit for any reason either. It's at this odd angle, so it seems to have been just casually discarded. Um, so my best guess is it was used to bail the pit out, either to keep the pit dry or so they could use the water. Um, it's a bit too big to be used as a, a urinal. It's about this big. Um, so if they were using it to bail the pit out and then they just left it there for future use and never returned for it, that would explain how it was found. So again, yet more water management. So after this phase, um, there's a big jump to the next phase. The entire 14th to 15th centuries are represented only by a thick layer of soil buildup. No surviving cut features, so there's nothing pretty to show you. But if we move on to the early post-medieval phase in green here, the most notable feature was this at the top, this stone-built tank. Um, and this one, we're pretty sure, was used as a cesspit, um, probably with an outhouse built over the top of it, just out the back of the buildings on the street frontage. Here's what it looked like. 1.2 metres by 1.4 metres internally, remains of a stone floor, possibly. You just see one stone slab surviving. And there was a chute um, that um, uh, steeply that went steeply into it at the northeast corner, um, and there was a stone roof tile found in the fill of the chute, which fitted neatly over the the gap. Um, so we think that could have been placed there to protect the night soil men when they were coming from incoming deposits when they were in there cleaning it out. Um, there was also a culvert at the base on the south side there, which flowed out of it. Um, and we found in the fill of the culvert remains of cess and fly puparia, which good evidence of its use. And we got a good date from two slow stones within the cess that implied that its last use was around 1610-ish. Now, it's interesting that such a utilitarian and largely invisible structure should be built out of stone because it implies that the street frontage was also built of stone at the time. And we know that building in stone in St. Andrews really took off in the, took off post-Reformation because of stone robbing from the castle and cathedral. So, chances are this was built in the late 16th century. So it really only was in use for a few decades. So fish, I promised you fish, here's fish. Um, we had fish remains from 12th and 13th century deposits and from the backfill of the post-med cesspit. And the two periods provide a nice contrast. The, um, the medieval remains include marine fish, quite varied, a lot of flatfish and herring. The fish were typically about 30 centimetres long. Um, the 17th century fish, far less variety. 
um, you can see the, the species that we found here. Um, and they were mostly from the remains of four very large Atlantic cod, 90 to 150 centimeters long. But we only found the heads. So this is butchery waste, it's not consumption. Um, the fishing industry, in fact, really picked up from the early 16th century, and clearly um, much deeper waters were being fished by this stage. And it's also interesting that we're getting fish butchery of such enormous fish um, occurring this far from the fishing keys in the fish market. I was picturing someone trying to carry a whole meter and a half long cod back from the fish market, which is about 220 meters east, and it would have been interesting. Um, the dead dog, by the way, was dumped in one of the medieval phase three pits, and scientific analysis of its bones indicates that a fair proportion of its diet was fish-based, marine-based. So fish were important even in the medieval period, if, if only for dog food. Um, so one last little aside, pottery imports. We had just six sheds of imported pottery at this site, the usual medieval Scarborough type, saint -Ange, North Sea imports. And I was just, I was comparing this to other sites in the town and musing about percentage of imports in proportion to distance from the docks and the marketplace. So I did a few sums for contemporary assemblages from other sites in the borough and I plotted them out. And I could only base this on percentage shared count which I know is a crude measure, but it threw up, it threw up something interesting. Um, now, pottery is generally supposed was not an important economic trade, um, but it can provide a tracer for other trades or for movement of people, possibly pottery being transported incidentally as the possessions of seamen or immigrants. So here are the pottery import figures for all the available sites listed in order of percentage, shared count, and here's our site, 100 North Street, right at the bottom, with a puny 1.7. Um, and as is expected, there's a distinct concentration around the harbour to the east. So the highest one is the Bayer Theatre, which is there at 7.1. And Auction Hall, also quite high, at 3.7. But then the next highest is this one here, South Street, um, which is higher than at... Uh, Castle Cliff and Cinema House up here, which are much closer to the, to the shore. So if you were to draw contour lines of this, they will kind of be going like across like this. So it's like the, the imported pottery is flowing further along South Street than you would expect, further along South Street than it is along Market Street or North Street. Um, and you might expect it to flow further along Market Street being marketplace. Um, now it's known that St. Andrews was home to English, Flemish and French immigrants. And it's possible a disproportionate number of them lived along South Street or possibly it was home to more seamen. Um, just a thought, crude figures, as I said, but thought it was interesting and that's it it's out as Rachel mentioned in the latest tap ad when it comes out shortly that's it